Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our study of Homer's Odyssey to book number three, what Fagels calls King Nestor Remembers. Now, if you haven't been following our work, you need to make sure to hit learnstrong.net. That AP folder is there. And take a look at the lectures that we've already um, given. In book one, just to give a quick review, in book one, we've got the invocation of the muse, the man of twists and turns. We have Athena, who will come to Ithaca as Mentus who will give Telemachus his mission at line 340. She tells him it's time for you to grow up. At book two, we have Telemachus calling the assembly. He will get mocked. He will, um, he will call down a, a revenge from Zeus and say, I hope these guys get what they deserve. Two eagles will clash right over their heads. The interpretation is a good one for Telemachus. And then finally, he will leave um, um, along with Mentor, who is, Achille, who is Athena, of course, and he doesn't want his mother to know. Now, the hope here again is that you are, you are doing your own reading of this stuff and then using me to kind of help you. Our learning theory needs to be articulated again. The connection of new information to old information in meaningful ways is our objective, and we do that through our annotative process by answering three guiding questions. At level one, what does the text say? At level two, what does the text mean? Here, we, of course, at 2A, themes messages at 2B. We're focusing at, uh, on the rhetoric, that is to say, um, not what Homer says, but how Homer says it. We're interested in symbolism, we're interested in irony, we're picking that up from our study of the Iliad. And then finally at three, we at level three, we ask, how can I relate to this information in meaningful ways? At 3A, other texts. Here we're focusing specifically on the Iliad. And then finally, of course, we're asking 3B, how can I relate to, my, to this information to me personally? Let's do a real quick review, as we always do, and then we'll get into the actual lines that we want to talk about. First, we have Telemachus and mentor Athena, who arrive at Pylos, where Nestor's palace is. Okay? They're sacrificing nine bulls to Poseidon. Athena will tell Telemachus, who, by the way, is the last one out of the boat. That tells us something, right? Hey, let's go. No more shyness. It's time. Telemachus says, I'm no good at talking, sounding very much like the Moses of the book of Exodus. Uh, I'm not in, in standing in front of the, uh, the burning bush there. I'm not really good at talking. Athena says, trust yourself. We are in Nestor's palace next, and we get to witness tremendous zania, that notion of the guest-host relationship or hospitality. It is similar to the way that, Achille, that, that Telemachus took care of uh, Mentus when Athena showed up in book one. Here, though, it's going to be Nestor's boy, uh, um, Pisterius, and he's going to take care of Telemachus in the same way that Telemachus took care of Athena, right? After a meal, you have lots of eating in the Odyssey, right? There's the question, who are you? And Telemachus will get around to asking, do you know anything about my father? That's why he's here, of course. Nestor, this won't shock us for those of us who have read the Iliad, Nestor gives a long speech, right? Old men love to tell stories, in other words. And he says several things. He says that Odysseus helped, really, to win the war, the great tactician of us all, he says. He says, you have your father's way with words already. He compliments Telemachus. He says Odysseus was my friend. He says that it's Athena's fault. Note the irony of this because Athena is sitting there as mentor. It was Athena's fault that trouble came for us after the fall of Troy and our going home. Why? In the same way that the Iliad began with a fight between Achilles and Agamemnon, it ends with, Achilles, with Menelaus and Agamemnon fighting. They're quarreling about the ways they should leave. Menelaus is ready to get home. Agamemnon says, no, let's sacrifice more to the gods. Um, it may be the case that in the back of Agamemnon's mind, he knows he's got to go home to Clytemnestra after 10 years. And, of course, he sacrificed his daughter to get to the walls of Troy, right? Uh, Nestor says, I made it home, but unfortunately Odysseus did not. He says, the Myrmidons made it home. That is to say, Achilles' troops made it home. Notice Achilles' men get home. Odysseus' men do not get home. Achilles doesn't get home. Odysseus does get home, right? Um, Philictetus, the, the uh, one that has the great bow and arrow sent from Hercules, he made it home. Idiomentus made it home. Um, but he says, Agamemnon, man, he made it home, but oh boy, I bet he wished he had never come home. He gets jacked by Aegisthus and, of course, Clytemnestra, his wife. But Nestor says, hurrah, Orestes got his revenge. And he says it in line 226, Nestor, be brave, Telemachus, and win Cleos or glory, right? Telemachus will say, I wish I could be like Orestes. He says his father will never return. And Athena pops up and says, that's nonsense. A god can make anything happen. And of course, in the end, she says, Odysseus is going to be way greater than Agamemnon in his homecoming. Telemachus then will come back to Nestor and say, 
Tell me the story about Agamemnon and Orestes. I think probably clear. He's more interested in Orestes and Orestes coming to avenge the death of his father, right? And he asked the obvious question, where was Agamemnon's brother Menelaus? Well, Nestor says, Menelaus got blown off course with Helen down in Egypt for all of those years. And he tells about how Aegisthus will seduce Clytemnestra. Uh, this is interesting because it mirrors to some degree the Penelope storyline in that Clytemnestra doesn't want to be with Aegisthus, but he's able to seduce her. And one of the things that he does is while Menelaus is down in Egypt, right, um, and, uh, and, and Aegisthus is, is seducing uh, Clytemnestra. Agamemnon left a poet in charge of Clytemnestra to kind of look out after her, and what Aegisthus does is he sends him away to a desert island to die alone, uh, and then of course he gets to have his fun with Clytemnestra. Um, meanwhile, of course, you're going to have the homecoming of Agamemnon, you're going to have the killing of uh, Agamemnon, and then you're going to have the arrival of Orestes to obviously get his revenge. And ironically, Menelaus Nestor says, shows up from Egypt right at the moment when Clytemnestra and Aegisthus are being given their funeral because Orestes has taken care of the business. Nestor then will say to Telemachus, hey, you need to get out of here, um, but I will help you. He says, I recommend that you get back home. He, he uses the Agamemnon story as an exemplar. Don't stay away from Ithaca and you're too long. Your mother unguarded and all of your stuff unguarded. But before you go back, he says, I recommend that you find Menelaus and you talk with him because he may know where your father's at. And he says he will help, and in fact he does. At the end of book three, we have Athena who will fly away as an eagle, immediately allowing Nestor to know that in fact they were in the company of a god. And he says as much to Telemachus, you're blessed like your father. They go to sleep that night. In the morning they wake up. Nestor and his six sons, again these are poems about fathers and sons, um, will sacrifice a bull to Athena. They eat a meal, again, lots of eating in the Odyssey. And finally, Telemachus and Pisteris, uh, the, the son of, of Nestor, are going to take off um, to um, get to Menelaus' palace. All right, let's go ahead now and turn for the remainder of our time together, looking at some of the specific lines that I think are some of the more fascinating lines of the, uh, of the book, book three. Um, let's begin, first of all, with Telemachus. They arrive at Pylos, and we're told at line 15 or so that Telemachus climbed out of the boat last. In other words, he's a little reluctant for this meeting with Nestor. With Athena far in front, the bright-eyed goddess urged the prince along, and this is what she says. Telemachus, she says, no more shyness. This is not the time. We sail the seas for this, for news of your father. Where does he lie buried? What fate did he meet? So, go right up to Nestor, breaker of horses. We'll make him yield the secrets of his heart. Press him yourself to tell the whole truth. He'll never lie. The man is far too wise. This gets said, repeated several times about people. It's said about Menelaus as well. He's not going to lie. He's going to tell you the truth, right? Which, of course, sits in diametric opposition to somebody like Odysseus, who, when asked by Polyphemus the Cyclops, who are you, he says, me, I'm nobody, right? The prince, Telemachus, replies at line 23, wise in his own ways too. How can I greet Nestor? He asks Mentor. Even approach the king. I'm hardly adept at subtle conversation. It's interesting to say that one of the things that's part of the building's drama of any young person as he or she develops is learning how to talk with adults, making requests, for example. He says it, someone my age might feel shy, what's more interrogating an old man. Telemachus, the bright-eyed goddess Athena reassured him, some of the words you'll find within yourself, the rest some power will inspire you to say, you, least of all I know, were born and reared without the God's good will. So in other words, don't worry about it. Find it within yourself. Be confident within yourself. So ultimately, this is exactly what happens, right? They show up. Um, um, uh, uh, the, the son of Nestor, uh, Pisistratus, is going to give him, give him help. And then finally, after they're fed, this is part of Zania, right? You feed first. Then the question is, Obviously, who are you? Where you come from? And it will be, in fact, Telemachus who will say, I'm here about my father. At line 101, he says, that's why I've come to plead before you now, if you can tell me about it's Odysseus's cruel death. Perhaps you saw him die with your own eyes or heard the wanderers in from someone else. More than all other men, that man was born for pain. We're going to hear about Odysseus's naming by his grandpa. And in fact, the name Odysseus means one who causes pain or suffering, or one who experiences pain or suffering. And we're going to see a lot of both for Odysseus, right? He says, Telemachus, don't soften a thing from pity, respect for me. Tell me, 
Clearly, all your eyes have witnessed. I beg you, if ever my father, Lord Odysseus, pledged you his word and made it good in action, once on the fields of Troy where you, Achaean, suffered, remember his story now. Tell me the truth. Nestor, the noble charioteer, replied at length. No kidding, Nestor always will reply at length. Ah, oh, boy, since you call back such memories, such living hell, we endured in distant Troy. We, headstrong fighting forces of Achaea, so many raids from shipboard down to the foggy sea, cruising for plunder, wherever Achilles led the way, so many battles round King Priam's walls we fought, so many gone, our best and bravest fell, and then he starts to list them. You know that he's going to get to, um, to his own son here in a second, Ant Antichilus, right? There Ajax lies, the great man of war. There lies Achilles, too. There Patroclus, skilled as the gods in council. And there my own dear son, both strong and staunch, Antilochus, lightning on his feet and every inch a fighter. But so many other things we suffered past that count. We know this because, of course, we've read the Iliad, right? What mortal in this wide world could tell it all? Now, if you sat and probed his memory five, six years, delving for all the pains our brave Achaeans bore there, your patience would fray. You'd soon head for home. This is, of course, a tipping of the hat to the Iliad, which, of course, when it's read out loud or recited, it does take a few hours, right? Nine years we wove a web. It's funny. Uh, it's an ironic descriptor, right? Wove a web of disaster for those Trojans, pressing them hard with every tactic known to man. But only after we slaved did Zeus reward us victory. And no one there could hope to rival Odysseus, not for sheer cunning. At every twist, the man of twist and turns, at every twist of saddest strategy, he excelled us all. Your father, yes, if you are in fact his son, I look at you, it's an interesting aside, I look at you and a sense of wonder takes me your way with words. It's just like his, I'd swear no youngster could ever speak like you, so apt, so telling. So he gets complimented for the very thing, obviously, that Telemachus was worried about, right? As long as I and great Odysseus soldiered there, why, never once did we speak out at odds. Neither in open muster nor in royal council. This is true from the Iliad, right? Nestor and, o and Odysseus are always together. Forever one mind and judgment balanced, shrewd. We mapped our army's plans so things might turn our best. But then, once we'd sacked Grand Priam's craggy city, Zeus contrived in his heart a fatal homeward run for all the Achaeans who were fools, at least dishonest too. So many met a disastrous end, thanks to the lethal rage of the mighty father's daughter, or so obviously uh, Athena, who ironically is sitting right there. Eyes of fire, Athena, Athena set them feuding, Atreus's two sons, and so we hear that in, for, in fact there was this long fight that took place, and finally um, at the end of Nestor's speech, he says it this way at line 211, 212, they say the Myrmidons, those savage spearmen led by the shining son of lion-hearted Achilles traveled home unharmed, Philictides, the gallant son of Pios, safe as well. Idiomentus brought his whole contingent back to Crete. All who escaped the war, the sea snatched none from him. But Atreus' son, Agamemnon, you yourselves even, right, in far off Ithaca, must have heard how he returned, how Aegisthus hatched the king's horrendous death, line 220. But what a price he paid in blood, in suffering. Oh, how fine it is when a man is brought down to leave a son behind. You can already see where this one's headed, right? Orestes took revenge. He killed that cunning, murderous Aegisthus who killed his famous father. And you, my friend, how tall and handsome I see you now. And then he says it. Be brave, you too, so men to come will sing your praises down the years. Gain Kleos. We're told Telemachus, weighing the challenge closely, answered, Oh, Nestor, son of Neleus, Achilles, pride and glory, what a stroke of revenge that was. All Achaeans will spread o o Orestes' fame across the world. A song for those to come. We think of uh, obviously of Aeschylus' Orestia trilogy. You can follow that work of mine on, uh, on Learn Strong in the Harvard Classics lecture, right? If only, he says, the gods would arm me in such power. I take revenge on the lawless brazen suitors, riding roughshod over me, plotting reckless outrage. But for me, the gods have spun out no such joy. For my father or myself, I must bear up. That's all. And Nestor says, oh yeah, I heard about these suitors. What's going on with that? And why do you let it happen? And he says, if only Athena, ironically, would lavish care on you the way she did on brave Odysseus years ago in the land of Troy. He said, everywhere that man went, Athena was right there. She always showed him favor. We know this, obviously, from our study of the Iliad as well. Finally, he says that uh, Telemachus, will, uh, T Telemachus will say that it's, it's not going to happen that my father comes back at line 255. Never, your majesty. That will never come to pass, Odysseus' homecoming. I know. 
What you say dumbfounds me, staggers imagination. Hope, hope as I will, that day will never dawn. Not even if the gods should, should will it so. Well, of course, the God who wills it so, sitting right next to him, is mentor. And so Telemachus um, will be responded to by, Ache by uh, Athena. And she says, what's this nonsense, line 263? What's this nonsense slipping through your teeth? It's light work for a willing God to save a mortal even half the world away. Myself, she says, I'd rather sail, sell through years of trouble and labor home and see that blessed day than hurry home to die at my own hearth like Agamemnon, killed by Aegisthus, cunning by his own wife. In other words, the reality is that, you know, Odysseus has a long time coming home, but it's a whole lot better than Agamemnon, who got home right away. Look what happened to him. But, she says, the great level or death, you'll remember in the Iliad, the great level or is war. Here it's the great level or death. Not even the gods can defend a man, not even one they love that day when fate takes hold and lays him out at last. Well, of course, those of us who have read the Iliad notice uh, will say, well, is that necessarily true? Because it's several times we know that Sarpedon, um, Zeus wanted to save, and Hera said, no, it's against the rules. But they saved Aeneas several times, right? Of course, we talked about that in our earlier lectures, right? Well, from there, uh, we then will move to Telemachus asking Nestor again about Agamemnon's homecoming at line uh, 298 or so, um, and, and uh, what happened at, at the very end, right? Like, what was going on with all of this? Well, uh, Nestor will say it this way. There we were, camp to Troy, battling out the long, hard campaign, while Aegisthus, at his ease at home in the depths of Argos, stallion country, he laid siege to the wife of Agamemnon. This is uh, luring, enticing her with talk. This is brilliant stuff. While we were sieging Troy, Aegisthus was seizing Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, with talk. At first, true, she spurned the idea of such an outrage. We immediately, of course, know that Telemachus is thinking about Antinous and the rest of those suitors who have been trying to convince Penelope. Why don't you just go ahead and admit that Odysseus is dead and marry me? Clytemnestra, the queen, her will was faithful still. And there was a man, what's more, a bard close by. This is funny because, of course, we're going to see the bard and the priest at the very end of this poem, right? To whom Agamemnon, setting sail for Troy, gave strict commands to guard his wife. The irony, of course, will be Agamemnon left, I'm sorry, Menelaus left Paris in charge of taking care of his wife, and we know how that worked. But in that day, the doom of the gods had bound her to surrender. Ajitsis shipped the bard away to a desert island, marooned her there, sweet prize for the birds of prey, and swept her off to his own house, lover lusting for lover. So it's interesting, while this is a poem about sex, we get a very clear indication that there are rules about sex. And in other words, taking another man's wife, major no-no. That is a violation of Zania in every way, right? Um, then we're told that afterwards, on the way home, Apollo will kill um, one of uh, Menelaus' men, um, Proteus. And Proteus, once he's dead, they pull in, they, they will do this um, burial thing. And then half of Menelaus' men, we're told, are kind of pushed off towards Crete, and the other half end up at Egypt. And um, so he says Menelaus was off getting money while Agamemnon was getting jacked. But we're told at uh, line 345, the eighth year after Aegisthus was king for seven years after he killed Agamemnon, the eighth year ushered in the return of Prince Orestes, home from Athens. Yes, he cut him down, that cunning, murderous Aegisthus who'd killed his famous father. Of course, this is going to mirror exactly what Odysseus and Telemachus will do later to the suitors, right? Vengeance done. He held a feast for the Argives to bury his hated mother, even craven Aegisthus too the very day that Menelaus arrived, right? And so he says it, dear boy, take care. Don't roll from home too long, too far, leaving your own holdings unprotected. And immediately we think, of course, of uh, a play that we'll study later, Shakespeare's Macbeth, where Macduff will leave in Act 4, Scene 2, his wife and child, son, Lady Macduff and son, and uh, uh, Macbeth will make sure that they're all exterminated and killed, right? So this notion of don't, don't, don't leave home too long, unguarded. Crowds in your, in your palace, so brazen, they'll carve up all your wealth, devour it all, and then your journey here will come to nothing. Still, he says, I advise you, urge you to visit Menelaus. And he says it at line 365, off you go, your ships and shipmates now, and then the question is, do you want to sail or do you want to go by land? Right? And um, um, the uh, decision is made, no, no, I think probably we'll go by land. There's going to be um, uh, then Athena who will say, hey, 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 it's time we got to go. 
you get the sense she's testing Nestor and his Aenea. She gets up to leave, and it will be Nestor that says, ain't no way you're leaving. We, I, you've got to stay here. we got to give you food and gifts and all that kind of stuff. Athena smiles, and she says, that is right. That is the way we take care of people. We have more eating at lines 380 and following. Um, and and, and, and uh, again, Nestor will make his overture, right? Athena will say thank you. And then very interestingly, at line 415, all of a sudden we're told with that, the bright-eyed goddess, because a uh, mentor, Athena, will say, I'm going to go back to the ships and check and make sure everything is, is good to go. And then all of a sudden, she says, you know what? It's time for me to leave. And then we're told at line 415, with that, the bright-eyed goddess winged away in an eagle's form in flight. Amazement fell on all the Achaeans there. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded um, in our reading of uh, the New Testament, you'll remember that in the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter in the second verse, there's a verse that says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Um, of course, this line, one that St. Augustine knew well. And so in Greek mythology, we will have gods and goddesses that come to visit. Often it is goddesses. And in the Bible, in uh, the New Testament, in Hebrews 13, 2, you got the idea that angels could show up. So in other words, be nice to people, you never know exactly who they might be. Amazement fell, we're told, on the Achaeans there. The old king is astonished by what he's seen. He grasps Telemachus' hands and he cries out to the prince, Dear boy, never fear, you'll be a coward or defenseless. Not if at your young age the gods will guard you so. For all who dwell in Olympus, this was none but she. Zeus' daughter, the glorious one, his third born, who prized your Gallian father among the Argives. Now, O queen, and then he prays to Athena, be gracious, give us high renown, myself, my children, my loyal wife and queen. Notice the word loyal, right? And I will make you a sacrifice, a yearling heifer, broad in the brow, unbroken, never yoked by men. I'll offer it up to you. I'll sheathe its horns in gold, which is exactly what we will have next that happens. You'll have the... Uh,